So today on the podcast, we have Bobby Labonte. If you don't know who he is, NASCAR Cup Series champion, old school racer, and just all around really nice guy. Hope you guys enjoy this one. If you do, give it a five-star rating, share it with some friends. Thanks. So uh, was it a tough to get used to the modified? Uh, you know, I, I kind of, I don't, I don't want to say not really, mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like it was no big deal, but, <laughs> um, I mean, if, I guess, I guess in a way it is because it, I haven't, I mean, I've not won every race, but, uh, but when I got in it, it felt pretty comfortable because I, t- I love the horsepower and the power to weight ratio and conserving tires a little bit more and. So mm. I, I like all that. So I, I, you know, our first race was good, you know, but yeah. we we just, uh, you know, we're competitive, um, but we're, you know, haven't found victory lane this year. But yeah, I mean, getting into it was, you know, actually, it, it seemed like maybe it was like an old shoe feels good mm. where, you know, you get into something and I mean, I've driven a bunch of things. I'm like, I don't feel comfortable. I'm not, you know, I can't really maybe feel it or in this thing here, you can feel the sidewall you could feel the grip you could feel the torque you could feel the the low center of gravity you know and you could feel all that and so it didn't matter what it looks like out here it just what it you know feels like in the wheel <clears throat> right right i had uh i had paul tracy on the podcast a few weeks ago and he had such good things to say about you driving the driving the srx car and oh. <laughs> he was saying how much he struggled with with getting in a stock car yeah and i mean it, you know for like you know for everybody's different, you know, and they, they're, you know, I mean, he obviously successful in IndyCar, uh, you know, Alio's successful, Kanan was successful in different ways, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's every discipline's always a little bit different and, uh, you know, whether, and it's all, to me, it's all about feel and, you know, visual and perception of what, you know, where's your comfort zone. And so Paul, you know, he probably drove it, drove the SRX, not like it should be driven just because he didn't have the feel of like, where, where does it go and how far can you push it? And, you know, where's the, the markers on your car, you know, to, to kind of give yourself the, the right discipline to make sure you complete every lap, you know, the best you can without messing up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, uh, all my, my racing guests, I want to, I want to kind of start back at the beginning and, and the beginning of your career. Uh, your, your dad was in, was it the Navy? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Navy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. And started you guys off in racing in, in quarter midgets. Now, did he start wrenching on cars before you were born or did that happen after you were young? Yeah, no, he was he was wrenching on cars. He was, uh, you know, grew up in Oxford, Maine, which uh, most people here would know Oxford, Maine is or Rumford, Maine is Oxford Speedway or mm-hmm. close to Oxford Speedway. So he he was, uh, you know, a little bit of a mechanic. I think he drove a little bit at Oxford, and you know, uh, and then the the Navy took over as far as what his choice needed to be or wanted to be. And uh, but yeah, he was always a mechanic of some type and worked on cars and, you know, had, he was a gearhead, I guess you might call it. So he did all that before he went into the Navy and, um, you know, as the Navy and Bell helicopters and Huey helicopters and, you know, engines and, you know, mechanic, you know, mechanically inclined throughout, you know, uh, you know, while he was in the Navy and stationed in in Texas. Right. So you, uh, like you're 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 what eight eight years or nine years younger than your brother or eight years? I, well, I have to correct you on that. It's seven and a half because it was really ah. precise on. He's more precise than I am. I could go eight or nine; it doesn't matter to me. But he's like, no, no, no. It's seven and a half. Seven and a half. Okay. So yeah, right on. <laughs> so you uh, was he already graduated into into full size cars when you started racing quarter midgets? Um, I think. You know, we were probably intersected a little bit, uh, you know, because I started when I was five. So that put six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, you know. So he probably was in a, I think he was in the last two or three years of quarter midget racing, um, you know, going up that route. When we started racing together, I mean, obviously I, I remember, uh, mm-hmm. but we had a trailer, you know, it was a, you know, a trailer leaf spring with plywood sides and two quarter midgets on top and 
two inside and motors and tires and we traveled to the races like that so we did race together not together but we raced in different classes on the same day and weekend right right so then you know i guess kind of moving along there he's he's running really successful in in stock cars uh in texas and was it was it kind of a shock to you how how quickly um uh, you know he he managed to progress his career or did you guys uh, not really know any different i don't know that we knew much different probably i mean i can remember you know we raced quarter midgets quarter midgets and then he started to uh you know race the uh uh the hobby stocks maybe hobby stocks you know 57 chevy mm -hmm. and uh so i think he was 16 at that point in time or probably 15 and three quarters and so um uh, so we started racing the hobby stocks at that time and you know obviously i'd quit quarter midget racing because we can't do both and uh but i mean his success was it was quickly at the the corpus christi speedway and track and corpus and you know winning races winning races and you know all this stuff so i mean of course we didn't know where that's going to go but i can remember as a seven and a half year younger brother to him that I'm like, when the fans boo you, I, I realized then the reason why they booed you is because you won a lot, right? And I would go to the payoff window with my dad, and we'd get $99 for winning the trophy dash, heat race, and the feature. So, right. so I mean, he was successful, you know, to, I guess, to answer your question. I mean, and so that, you know, and I mean, you know, I don't know how else to explain it, but that that's just kind of how I think you, it should go is you do something and you, you, you get success and it springboards to the next thing the next class, the next track, the next series, the next whatever, right? And so, you know, I feel like early on, you know, even though I didn't know as, you know, any better, I knew that we were running race, races. I knew that, you know, so as a kid in the grandstand watching, I knew that I'm cheering for my brother and he's winning races. So it seemed like it was all successful to me. And, you know, I knew that he was, you know, getting to be really, really good at what he was doing. From – when he when he made that jump to North Carolina and and from the outside looking in it looks like you guys have or had still like a really tight knit family doing everything as a team was it a big discussion do you remember to pick up the family and and move to North Carolina to go chase this cup dream yeah i mean obviously uh, i'll remind you that i was not part of the discussion <laughs> right i was too young to have a voice in that fight and as well as it should be. I didn't, I mean, when you're 15 years old, you don't ask your 15 year old, what do you think, what do you want to do? Right. I mean, it's pretty much kind of standard right there. So, uh, but I remember, uh, you know, my dad still worked for a rad Mac and in flower buff bluff and corpus or right outside of corpus. So, and he went on a, uh, he got a early medical retirement. So, um, uh, and, we came to North Carolina, took a little trip and kind of like gave it a once over look. I think we go back, Terry moved. So when the time came to move, I don't know how it all worked. Cause I wasn't, as I shouldn't have been part of the discussion, but I remember it's like, Hey, we're going to get out of that school and we're going to load up like the Beverly Hillbillies and we're going to drive to this place and you're going to go to that school. All right. And so, when Terry moved up here, up here to North Carolina, it was real simple that my dad and we all, you know, wanted to be there because uh, that's just what we're doing. Right. And, um, uh, so we, it was a simple process. Right. Uh, I remember my dad, we moved up, we left on a Friday and I think he was at work on Monday, to be honest with you. You know, I mean, it just, I mean, because it's what you do, you know, we have to, we have to work, we have to do this and yada, you know, so, um, as a kid, 15 years old, I'm like, I mean, I'm loving it. It's all good with me. Uh, other than I didn't get to go to the beach as much because in Corpus, you get the beach and here you got four hours. So, but no, I mean, it was good. I mean, you know, I mean, you find things to do when you're here and you go to a different place, I guess it's, I just thought of it no big deal because we're as a family, we'll go together. Right. So yeah, obviously you guys are moving there 
because of his racing. Now, do you have to take a, a little bit of a hiatus to, to find racing again in North Carolina? Well, I, I had started racing quarter midgets, I'm sorry, go-karts, uh, kind of after he moved to North Carolina. So my dad and I went to this little track called Mathis Speedway, I guess. It was on Mathis Lake. It was a little go-kart track, you know. So we did that for several months, you know, until the time came to, to move. And so, um, you know, I brought my go-kart with me. So, I mean, you know, again, back then, you're 15, there was the exercise was choices of less to race than 15 today, of course, right? So we, we go-kart raced, you know. So Terry's on the cup side, you know, my dad's working on the weekends. There's less races, more weekends to spend at home. So we would go-kart race when we could. could. So uh, my hi- hiatus was... I mean, not a whole lot because, I mean, in Corpus, there wasn't a whole lot to do either. You know, quarter uh, go-kart racing, sure, but it wasn't nothing like you get here and there's like, hell, there's quarter meter. Tra- I mean, there's go-kart tracks, you know, kind of located wherever you want to go, dirt or asphalt. Right. Was there any thought put behind going from, you know, your brothers in cup, you're racing quarter midgets, that's all oval stuff. Now you're in an enduro cart racing on road courses, was it like, hey, this is going to be an adjustment, I I like this kind of racing, or was it just, uh, this is a place to go race, racing is racing? Yeah, I think racing is racing, and, and, and really it was just the opportunity, I mean, you know, when you got a, uh, when you got a Yamaha chassis uh, with a McCullough 93 motor, we got a McCullough 101, we put dual carbs on it, we'd race at a dirt track, stripped all the teeth off the clutch. I tell my dad, I said, too dirty. I don't want to do this. Mm. So we hook up with CKS South, which is Comet Cart Sales South. So Norwood Stone owned that part where obviously um, uh, the Dismores owned the North, right? So, and my dad, you know, we're just, you know, we're just racing. And it's like, all right, what do you want to do now? I mean, I don't want a dirt race because it was a pain in the butt, right? So you go to the go-kart tra- shop, CKS South in Jamestown here, and you, you you see Eddie and you see all these guys, and you're like, well, like what do y'all do? Well, y'all, we race go-karts, and we sell parts. And what kind do you race? Well, you got these Enduros. Well, where do y'all race them at? Well, Rockingham. You want to go down there? Sure. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay. So, you know, I've just, you know, as a, you know, I think I was 16 at the time. It's like, you know, back then you just, I'll, I'll get in the car and drive down there myself, you know, no no cell phones to call your parents, tell you where you're at or where you're going. So anyway, so I go down there and my dad would go, we bought a go-kart and we'd race and, you know, it just turned out that it's like, okay, Enduros is what these guys sold the most. And that was popular at the time. And we had Rockingham, we had Charlotte, we had Roebling Road. Uh, we can go to Talladega, you know, we can go to uh, Daytona and race. And uh, so we just did it, you know, and it's like, okay, so that filled out, you know, eight or 10 weekends a year. Uh, and so, you know, it's just kind of what we did and we would, you know, do two or three at Rockingham and then we'd spread them out on along the other places. And I would go with them. My dad wouldn't even go. And I'd, I'd sometimes start my own cart, get in it and take off and go on the start. And those guys would come make sure I'm safe and let me go. And I'd come back and they're like, Hey, or, uh, you know, one or the other. So, and it was just happened to be on road courses. Right. I mean, I, I mean, it didn't matter to me. I got a two cycle and it burns a lot of fuel and oil and it was awesome, you know? So uh, I enjoyed that because it was, it was so much fun. I learned a lot and uh, got to be with some good people. Right. Now this whole time you've got your brother to compare yourself to, to some degree, you know, it sounds, it's, you make it sound like you're kind of just going out racing for fun, but do you have aspirations and, you know, seeing your brother being able to make a living doing this, uh, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. We're cut from the same cloth. Is that kind of the mentality or you're just racing for fun? Well, I think I'm racing for fun. You know, obviously when you go home at night and your dad reads every hot rod magazine, stock car racing magazine, motorcraft magazine, you know, whatever it might be, magazine of a car in it. I mean, you're just 24 seven, right? And then Mm -hmm. you, hear the stories and you go to the races and you watch and you you're a part of it and you you know you take small engines class in high school and you know you 
you get out at at one o'clock through the program ICT ICT program I think it was called here, and you go work at the dealership for a while, and you go by the race shop every day and you know sweep floors and this and that. So you know you just it's in your blood. You know, obviously, I didn't just wake up and go, hey, I was a violinist one day. Now I'm going to race cars, you know, uh, or I was this and I want to do that. And I mean, so doing it, go-kart racing, meeting all these people. And, you know, so I just, you know, I think I just really, I really wanted to, but how do you do it? I mean, right. at that point in time, again, not like today, opportunity-wise, you just crawl, uh, uh, you know, crawl, but you you scratch and claw at everything that you can get. And so, you know, I get an opportunity and beg and borrow and beg and borrow and put everything together and, you know, go run one race and look like a turd and back up and, you know, wait and try again sometimes. So always had the feeling that I wanted to do that. Um, you know, who knows how, how long that would last and if you'd ever get to do it again after the last one, you know. So at that point in time, it's not like we had a schedule that says you're going to run NASCAR late mile stock every weekend. You're just going to run something. And you just, I mean, we all wanted to be like Terry, Kale, David, you know, Benny, all these people. Uh, So, you know, I mean, you know, you just had that where you wanted to be, but, you know, your your expectations, I don't know where it was all going to go, but you hope that it would go further. Right. So, so to say fast forward a little bit, you're, you graduate high school and you're working in a cup shop full time. Is that right? And it, yeah. at that at that time, is that your yep. your the team your brother's running for Hagel? Yeah, yeah, Hagen. It is, Hagen. and uh, yeah. yep, and it, it is, and uh, you know, again, yeah. I mean, I think uh, I think I was definitely graduated from high school. I think I spent a little time at the dealership working for a Buick dealership locally as a shop form, uh, not shop foreman, as a uh, shop mechanic. You know, finally got to work on you know service new cars, service old cars, and just do whatever I could do and take old ladies back to their house and bring the car back, you know, just stuff like that, whatever happened. So anyway, so uh, that was part of it. And then going to the shop again, you know, graduated high school, get into the shop and trying to be a mechanic, trying to learn more and hang out more and, you know, just raise my hand when they, you know, the floor's dirty, I'll clean it, you know, or, you know, here, here, can you, somebody go to the bank and get us a bunch of dollar bills? Yeah, I'll go do it, you know, so wash the van, I'll do it. So that's how I kind of incorporated myself after school, you know, to get in to work on race cars because my dad was a mechanic. I mean, I'm still racing a little bit, but not like, you know, not every weekend. Right. And are you like like having that that view into the cup world, realizing how much money it takes? You know, it seems like you're it seems like you're doing it old school where you're working in the shop and you're and you're. (laughs) you know, doing what you can, do you appreciate it that much at that time, how important sponsors are, or are you just going to do it on your own regardless? And like, are you uh, really hunting sponsors kind of in those early late model years? Yeah, I don't, you know, we had a couple sponsors. It's, it's funny. We had, uh, this friend of ours and it, it's all about relationships. A lot of times. I mean, obviously, uh, I'll, I'll share with you back even in the go-kart days, I'm a big Tim Richmond fan and, I mean, he's like, man, he's got it going on, and he's probably like the Burt Reynolds of the movie, you know, I mean, and so when I go to the racetrack, you know, you'd say, you know, good Lord, I I mean, he's just kind of a, you know, he's a flash, right? So I remember sending a proposal, because I had, you know, I I don't know how you do it, I don't know how we did it back then, you just meet people, and uh, same way today, but you don't trade Twitter handles, you you say, Hey, I'll see you next week. Right. Mm -hmm. So I remember I still have somewhere the proposal to the game card Uno that, you know, he had on his car Uno. So I gave it to the guy, you know, like, Hey, sponsor my go-kart, right. My go-kart. So I had a picture of my go-kart with a hat beside it. And, you know, it's like, so trying to get a sponsor for, because we're going to go racing anyway, but it'd be cool if you had something else on it. Right. So that was even the go-kart days. And then when you go to late models or, you know, the late model sportsman and trying to do a race here. It's like we had a friend that owned an oil company and uh, some gas stations and, and he was just befriended us. And we, you know, uh, Bill was a great guy. And, you know, he would, I mean, he, he's the type of guy that said, 
you know, I talked to him and, you know, I was, uh, had a 69 Camaro, sold it, got a pickup truck because it made more sense. Then I became a little bit older and I thought an 82 Camaro was going to be better, right? T-tops, girls, you know, the whole thing. So he, he kind of said, okay, I'll help you make, I'll help you buy it, but you got to make the payments. So he gave me like $1,500 or the difference between my truck selling and all that stuff. So that was influential that I had people to help me in different ways, right? But he sponsored our car, you know, and he would make you work for it. You didn't just, he just didn't say, hey, we're going to, we're going to give you $10,000. He said, I'll, I'll give you $500 to buy a set of tires, but he made you work for it in different ways and not sign autographs or appearances. It's just, you know, work it off different ways is working on your car and, you know, teaching you life lessons. Uh, I had a sponsor one time is Hayes Jewelers, right? Hayes Jewelers of Lexington, North Carolina. They still sponsor Modifieds today. They spawn. I have known them for since 1982, uh, Bruce and Zach, and they're right down, you know, 20 miles from here. And I walk in there today. It's just like back then, you know, so you have those friends that help you out and you don't go look for sponsors per se, but you know, you know, if you if you're only going to win three hundred bucks, they're not going to give you three thousand dollars. They're going to give you one hundred fifty bucks, right? So back then, you could kind of afford it, right? So sponsor hunting wasn't really a big deal. It was just basically how can we put this together? And you meet a Mike Swain that he had a company that helped you know put the car on a track, and you get the motor, and I'll let you drive it. You know, so it was hodgepodge it all together without having a budget or a sense of like what a sponsor can do for you. And uh, right. so we just kind of went and I'll come up with a, I'll, I'll tell you about my first sponsor later, but uh, it was kind of odd, but you know, where we went racing, we didn't have a sponsor, you know, we just kind of raced and you, know, you weren't, you won the money and you could buy tires the next week. Right. You raced, right. you won money, you buy the tires. So, so sponsors were like, we didn't know how, I mean, how, how do you do that? Right. You just race. Right. R now, right around that time, and I'm not sure exactly on the timeline, you spend a couple years pretty seriously uh, crewing for your brother. Yep. And, you know, your your dad's in that world, you're in that world. Could you have gone that route, do you think? And just, you know, did you have in your mind, hey, maybe I could be a crew chief one day or maybe, you know, I could, I could you know, rise up in the shop and, and be a really good guy or was it always racing in your mind? Well, I was doing enough racing on the side and I say enough, I was doing a little racing on the side when I worked there from 82 ish, 83, 84, 85, 86. Okay. And so I was, you know, went from sweeping the floors, mopping the floors to doing a lot more than that. And so as the time went on, I mean, you know, I mean, at that point in time, you're thinking, you know, I'm 20 years old, 21, 22, you know, and you're going, um, and you're saying to yourself, you know, like, I mean, I'm still trying to race on the weekends, but I mean, it's four times a year, it's seven times a year, eight times a year, you know, I mean, it kind of fluctuates, not like every weekend, which, you know, that's all you can do, it's all you know. And I mean, there was a point in time, it's like, if you look back on it, I was, you know, learning a lot, doing a lot. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that would have ended up being the option if that, if racing hadn't worked, driving hadn't worked out, but you know, I was definitely had a good time and I learned a ton about people racing, um, you know, from A to Z <clears throat> minus sponsors probably doing all that. <clears throat> right. Right. So you decide, and I don't know how much it is your deal or your family's deal is to, to go bush racing and start your own team. Yeah. Is that kind of, is that your own separate deal? Was that a big discussion with your dad saying, hey, can you help me do this? Or is it just continually, we're racing, we're racing, we're racing, this is the next step? Yeah, well, so this this is brings up to where the sponsor came in, okay? Where a real sponsor came to us, right? So, and how it all happened, it's funny how life works. Is like, um, as, as I was a mechanic and was just now making $750 a week, okay, back in 1986, so and I'm, good so money. I'm very good money, right? And I am like, man, I am learning. I am English wheel and fenders on. I am heliarch and this. I am doing that with so many great people that have taught me so much. And I know what a roll, uh, uh, roll center is now. And, you know, I'm back in the engine shop taking 
uh, engines apart, magna flux and pistons and crankshafts and watching and watching and learning, right? So that was my college. You know, that was my college, four years of college, right? So, uh, so whenever the decision came to Terry to drive for Junior Johnson, which was the right move because it was, you know, this is not going right. Money's not right. Other teams getting bigger. You know, I mean, it kind of goes like that. So he goes up there. So they came in one day and they said, uh, I'll never forget. They came in there and they told my dad said, Hey, you know what? <laughs> you know, you're out. Well, you're, he works there. I work there. Right. So they told him to go hightail it out. And he's fired. Right. Because your son is going to junior Johnson. Right. So he Conflict ended up getting of interest. Yeah, it's a little conflict of interest, obviously. So he goes, he gets a job for Junior Johnson anyway, you know. Well, I'm I'm still in college, per se, right? Mm. So I, it was funny because I would, after I made it through lunch, and I'm like, I must be good, all right? So I'm down there rolling a fender for this car and, and the English wheel, and the guy come down and Wayne. I mean, it, nothing, it's nobody's fault. It's just, it just happens, right? But I was really content on like, this is great. I am making 750 bucks a week. I race seven times a year, and, well, you know, my life is good, right? So right. Af- after lunch, they come down and said, hey, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm making this fender, you know? And I said, no, what are you going to do next year? And I went, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, it's got to ride the heart. Yeah, you're fired. And I was like, ah. Oh. So as I tried to find a couple other jobs, and I can't find no jobs. I mean, you know, nobody want to hire me because I'm conflict of interest or, hey, do you know how to do body work? And like, you know, because I don't right. want to do body work. You know, and I'm like, I've been there and done that. I don't want to do it anymore. So anyway, I, I, I finally said, well, I guess I'll race. So that, at that point in time, you think about it, Gary, you know, where you have a moment that I could have, if I could have, if they would have not have fired me, what would have happened? I would have stayed there as long as I could. I was making good money, you know. But as it turned out, when they say you're fired, well, you're not making any money. You, you know, you've lost all your income. And I'm, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think I'm still living at home at this point in time. So it's not like terrible, but I'll still have food. But yet it's like my, what are you going to do now, right? So, all right, well, my dad had a shop and we had, you know, we were, I can't, we were, we we're starting to build this car. So I go work for a friend of mine, Jay Hedgecock, builds race cars for 250 bucks a week. Jeff Burton works there or is going to work there and all that stuff. So we just raced. So we just, again, we started off the year and said, hey, well, let's race. And we raced at Caraway Speedway which was that close to our house. So we can get there in 20 minutes, cheapest place to go. Mm. And so halfway through there, through the year, a sponsor came up and said, Hey, we want to sponsor you. And I'm like, man, my car is all red. You want it black. Okay. So winter circle auto parts, Maurice Petty and associates. So they sponsor my car. So we ran that paint scheme the rest of the year. And that guy wanted to go Bush grand national racing. So he afforded, he helped us to your question. He helped us get to that point. So we would run late models and we'd run a few bush races. You know, we'd run late models and run a few more bush races. So we got to the point where we're now, what are we going to do? We're going to run some more bush races. We got actually pretty decent at it. Right. So then it was like, you know, all in on going bush grand national racing as, as hard as we can and figure out how we're going to pay for it. We didn't have right. the money to start. Did those, if you won a, a bush grand national race, in those days, did it pay for your weekend? Uh, I, I think it might have. I didn't win enough to really pay for the weekend. I, I'd say because I probably overspent. Yeah. I mean, I did. I mean, I didn't have. I didn't go. Remember, my four years of college was not business. It was welding, heliar, uh, uh, English wheeling, and parts, and this and that. So, uh, you know, we we probably. I mean, we we always made we always made out where we didn't, we, we ended the year with a surplus of money Okay. to, to, to go into the next year. And whether it was getting more money from Oldsmobile, getting money from Chevrolet, you know, or getting money from, um, you know, or, or product, you know, or, you know, your, your quartermasters, your solder seals, your competition cams, um, you know, people like that, that you would, you know, rely on to help pay for things and, you know, make it all work, uh, you know, to, to get to make ends meet. And we we didn't have any more. It's not like we had a bucket somewhere in the back. We just had to operate on what we had. And we were smart about that. And Wagner built our motors. And, you know, we 
you know, paid for, I mean, we paid our bills, but we just had to, you know, uh, I mean, I've been to the racetrack before in a series of events earlier with my brother and I got to the racetrack and I bought $800 worth of parts to finish the car that I didn't have the money for. And I was just right. hoping we want enough money to pay for it. And we did. And then I sold the car to get more money, you know, so to, to build another car. So I don't know. I mean, no, different than today, but that's just how we did it. And we just kind of made money or succeeded enough to get a little further better the next year. Right. Was there a big sponsor or anything that happened to help you, you know, give you the push to say, hey, let's go, let's go bush racing full time and, and really try and, you know, win a championship at this thing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So the year that we went in 1990, so we had Winter Circle Auto Parts and they kind of, they've run their, they've run the gamut, they're done. Okay. Mm. So the next year we're going to race and how we're going to race, right? So one of the guys that used to work for Terry and good friend of ours and um, we got a car and went to Raleigh and met with the people at Goodmark Foods, which owns Slim Jim mm. and uh, Penrose Sausages. And I don't know how, but we talked Dick Miller and uh, Andy and a couple other people into sponsoring us, right? And it was $300,000 for the year. Okay? Wow. wow. And so, but we, we walked over there, we walked in there, and I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was trying to tell the story, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but I remember we walked back into the shop to show my dad we had a check for 50000 that they gave us. So we're going to Daytona, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's got to last a lot longer, but we got to, we're going racing. Right. So we walked in there with a $50,000 check that, and that was, the, that was the one, I mean, that was the break that we got and Dick Miller and, and everybody there, they were, you know, we had Penrose and we, you know, built a couple cars and, you know, we didn't have a tractor trailer and, you know, we just had, a, had three or four employees, I think it was, you know, and just, you know, put our own bodies on and, you know, started to get, you know, better, but that was a sponsor. And they were with us for between Terry and Justin and myself for, for 10 years, I think, wow. uh, if I'm not mistaken. So, so you guys, you know, pretty, pretty early on, as far as things go, you win the, the Bush championship. Now, does that, does that, does something click in your mind or, or does that, you know, put the idea in your mind, Hey, I can, I can, be a Winston Cup driver. I can be a Cup driver. I can I can compete with these guys. I've raced against these guys on on Saturday, and you know I can I can hang. I'm as long as I keep doing this and have good results, someone's going to find me. Well, I mean that's that was obviously you know as the Cup Series had 43 drivers. Actually, they had more drivers because a lot of people didn't make races. But you know 43 drivers on Sunday. You know people not always going to be in the same seat all the time. And there back then there was like you know seven or eight really good rides, you know, maybe nine. And so, um, and there were so many different car owners, right? Mm. But to your point is I thought back then racing against, you know, the first race at Daytona racing against Harry Cant, Harry Gant, but he didn't own his own car. Or somebody else did race to get er race against Earnhardt. He owned his own car. Dale Jarrett owned his own car. Um, Ernie Irvin, I think he owned his own car. Hmm. Uh, you go down the list of all the cup guys that race, and all of them really owned their own cars, right? So they were, you know, Dale Jarrett had Nestle Crunch, you know? And so you, if you can race against them and you, you continue to race against them and, uh, and you start to run with them or run close to them, next to them, and if you can outrun them, then obviously the garage is looking more, looking then, not more, but looking then, and the, the difference in the field was similar because there was no cup in the, uh, there was no cup thing that said, here's the, you know, here's all the influx of money. Right. Uh, so we were all just, you know, I, we own my, my own, my team. You race against Dale Earnhardt that owned his own team. He got motors from, you know, Fryer or, or Ruggles or wherever. And I had Wagner, you know, and Tommy Houston owned his own car, you know, I mean, so, but the cup guys, I think it definitely gave you the confidence that you needed and, and everything to say, Hey, we're going to, you know, you know, if you do this, if you do this and you want to do it, people start, you start hearing things, you start, uh, you know, talk, uh, cause there's so many different car owners that, you know, in my case, Bill Davis, but I mean, there's different car owners that Stavola and this and that, that are like, 
hey, we're interested, you know, because you are winning races, you are, you did win a championship, and that seemed like a trend, you know, as, as Dale Jarrett, you know, and, and other people, you know, kind of win a championship, and you kind of, you can kind of set your course a little bit, or at least you have an opportunity for your course. Right. When, so it sounds like it's a different feeling than today. So that, that Bill Davis deal, that's your first year in, in Winston <clears throat> Cup. And is it like a feeling of relief, like a feeling like I've made it, or is it just simply the next step? I'm still racing. Uh, I think it was the next step. Uh, you know, I mean, because your eye is always on the goal to, you know, to win, right? And then if mm -hmm. you win one, you want to win two, three, you know, down the line, whatever that number is, right? So goals are important. And, um, you know, when uh, when Jeff Gordon's deal didn't work out with Bill after the Bush Grand National Series, you know, he called me and said, hey, man, you want to drive my car? So I was still running the, the Bush Series that year in 92 and, you know, had this opportunity. And, you know, I, I looked at it the way I grew up and the way I talk about mechanics and mechanicing and going to my school and learning the trade. Uh, you know, I, you know, obviously – you know, if Rick Hendrick would have called and Bill Davis called, Bill's an easier step for me to say we can grow together, right? And, you know, Jeff, a little bit different. I mean, he'd kind of succeeded in a lot of ways, and he went to Hendrick, which was fine. You know what I mean? And I was comfortable with what you're – I'm comfortable with what you're comfortable with, and I'm like, okay. So Bill's a great guy. Uh, just talked to him again the other day. And, uh, you know, so, you know, that seemed like a great – fit for me it was right down the street from Hagen uh right down the street for me and so yeah I mean that was the the fit and you know our goal is to you know how you know you know got to have a sponsor but how do we you know go out and be the best you can be and get better all the time and you know ultimately you want to win you, everybody wants to win right 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 how you know I think for a lot of guys um making that jump you know getting into the into the garage every weekend now with with guys they've looked up to like you know real legends of the sport and kind of really grown men they you know sometimes you'd have imposter syndrome was having your brother already there for so many years did that did that help with that or did you feel like you you know did you feel like you had imposter syndrome a little bit when you made it to cup uh well the way i explain it is you know without terry Without Terry and the la his last name, or our last name, without Terry mm -hmm. being as successful and having the last name that um, that we have, you know, I probably wouldn't have had some doors open up, you know, that, you know, if, if you know, if I had a different name, it might not have opened the doors up, right? Sure. So it definitely opened doors and gave way to opportunities. And I always said that came to a point. And then at that point in time, at that point in time, it's like that, that shut, that door shut or that coattail, I fell off sure. the coattail. Yep. Because then it's like, now there's more pressure into, hey, you're compared now. You're more of a comparison than, a, you know, helping the little guy out, the, the little brother out, right? Mm -hmm. So then the comparison went to like, well, your brother, this. And so if you finish 25th and he finishes third, I know people can, you know, Hendrick to Bill Davis or whatever to whatever. But yet at the same time, you know, that week in and week out, you know, that gets a little bit like, all right, because there's no guarantee you're going to be as good or better than your brother. Right. It's just, mm -hmm. it's not until you prove it. So for me, I was always that opened the doors up and then it finally got to the point where now there's more pressure, I think on me to, because you had to, you had to uphold that. So that was kind of tricky. I don't know about your imposter, how you, you know, but that's how I explain it where yeah. I was like, now I've got to stand up as Bobby Labonte, not Terry's brother. Right. Did he, uh, did Terry help you, help you out at, at, you know, going through the tracks with you saying, you know, telling you how to drive the car and, and how to, you know, help set it up and talk to everyone and whatnot? Well, I mean, Terry helped me out from my late model day. I mean, he always supportive, first of all. First and foremost, always supportive, no matter what. Uh, mm -hmm. Go-karts to whatever. I mean, he, you know, he, he couldn't go maybe to the go-kart races that I would go to because the same weekend he's racing when I was younger. But whether it was late models, started off in late models at Caraway Speedway. I mean, 
it'd be hard for me to go, hey, I'm going to go Caraway Speedway tonight because so-and-so is racing and I want to go watch. I'd be like, we'll just watch it on flow or something. I'll just sit here, you know. So it's a little bit different today, but he would always support me in every which way I went. And the advice that he gave me back a long time ago was, hey, you need to win a race at Caraway. You need to win a race before you go anywhere else. Because I was trying to do too many different things. Uh, that's where we're different in myself. <laughs> so I was, I was ah, going all over the place. And so he, uh, he kind of sat me down and said, hey, do that, right? So I kind of, I won a race and we went to Concord. We won a race and went back somewhere, you know. And that kind of helped, like, okay, kind of be successful before you go. So he always supported me. Now, when you get to race in the Cup Series and, you know, I mean, Bush Car National Series, even back in the day, I mean, I mean, trust me, we used his truck. I used his cars. I wiped them out. I fixed them. I did this, you know, so he gave me everything that more than anybody else could ever give. And, you know, but I, I don't know that, you know, I don't know that it was like, you know, we go to Sonoma for the, for the first time and he's been there a couple times before. I mean, it's not like today, you know, you need to shift here, you need to shift there. It's like, well, you'll figure it out, you know. <laughs> I mean, because back then it's like, you'll figure it out, you know. I mean, he couldn't tell me how to go a 55-second lap at Pocono. I had to run a 60-second lap for a while and figure it out. And he's like, well, you should shift. Oh, or don't shift. Oh, okay. Well, you figure it out. So I don't know that we would ever talk really about, you know, hey, when you enter the corner, you need to start – you know, the precision of, uh, I mean, just know what you know and go do it, right? Right. Do you think that that mentality was different back then? And in my mind, in my mind, like, you know, not having been alive back then, but in my mind, it was different just simply because of the amount of time you guys got for testing compared yeah. to today. Uh, a lot of it was. I mean, I, I, I think I had... One record one summer, I spent 28 days in a car in a row between Bush Car National Racing, line to the test, cup racing, test, test, cup, Bush Car. You know, I mean, it was like 28 days in a row I was in a car. And so, yeah, I mean, and we, we get to the racetrack and, you know, back in the Bush Car National days and early on, you'd, you know, you'd come with four springs and the crew chief would say, well, we're going to try this this weekend, right? There was not an engineer to tell you that you're going to, that's it, right? And that's as fast as you're going to go. So back then you were trying stuff. So you're always practicing, always testing, uh, you know, and things like that to, you know, so you'd, you know, go as, or feel as you go and go as you feel and, you know, learn as you go, I guess. Uh, more so than obviously today's a different story. Right, right. <clears throat> so tell me about how the Gibbs deal came, ab came about for you. Because obviously that's, that was the next step in your career and that seemed like a, a good jump. I mean, that car had the 18 car had won the Daytona 500. That's a, a great opportunity in in your eyes, I assume. Yeah. I mean that, that, you know, obviously, um, you know, I had set my, you know, set down with Bill and started off said, you know, we're going to be here for like five years, you know, and you know, the sponsor that we had with Maxwell house, uh, they left the sport after two years, but didn't know mm -hmm. if he was going to have a sponsor, you know, here rumblings is going to have a sponsor. And then, you know, Dale Jarrett, I think, uh, I see Ernie Irvin, Ernie Irvin got hurt. So Robert Yates is talking to him about replacing Ernie until he gets better. Uh, Dale's with Joe Gibbs. And even though they want to race the Daytona 500, it's whatever, you know, I mean, you know how it it's is. It's a new Life team. Is, it's not working or it's not meshing or he thinks there's an opportunity. I mean, that's the worst thing is you see something over there better, right? So... I mean, we talk back and forth, and he's like, if I can get out of this ride, do you, you know, do you think you can get out of your ride and you could drive this car? That way, if you could drive this car, then they'll maybe let me go a little bit easier, you know? I'm like, mm. ah, yeah, I don't know. So we talked every night. We're like, okay, how about now? Well, no, T-shirt sales. Oh, they, I owe this much. Oh, shoot, you know? And it was just trying to navigate those waters, right? And I remember I was in at High Tech, the trailer company, right, uh, talking to Bruce one day. Uh, up there ordering a new trailer for my Bush team. And he calls and uh, Robert Yates calls says, Hey, do you have a problem with Mac tools? I said, no, do you have a problem with so-and-so? No. All right. I'll get back with you. Cause if Dale Jarrett can't drive this thing, I'll get you driving. I was like, okay. You know, I'm like, Whew. wow. All right. You know, it's like, you know, my head's spinning because it's like, well, we're, you know, 
because they might not let him out of his contract. I still got to get out of mine. And of course, I don't, you know, if we'd have had a sponsor for three more years, it'd been different. We, you know, we got Phil. I mean, the thing's coming, but it's just, you know, when is it going to happen? It's that, I hate when it gets to that time, you know, you'll, I'd rather know in October before November 8th, right? November 12th. So at the last race. So anyway, so long story short, Bill, uh, well, let's see, I think Robert paid Joe, Joe paid Bill, R Dale drove Robert's car, I drove Joe Gibbs' car, and I think Randy LaJoy drove that car, the, the 22 car. So that's how it kind of all spanned and it came together, and, you know, obviously at that opportunity came, uh, you know, to drive for Gibbs, and I'll be honest with you, I thought that was the right, I felt like it was the right thing, and it turned out to be the right thing uh, for me. Right. So for a brief period of time, you must have been thinking, holy cow, I could be in the 28 Robert Yates car, you know, the car to be in. Uh, how long did that last for? Were you nervous about potentially being in a car where there was no excuses? Uh, it didn't last long because, I, you know, the whole transition was quick and, you know, it was more or less like Robert called and I said, hey, if this doesn't work, mm. we could do this, right? Well, okay. I mean, you don't have a problem with all these guys. No, I've already got a Mac tool deal. You know, I've already got this. I've already got that. So uh, no, no sponsor conflicts. Right. And so, you know, I mean, it didn't last long because I was always talking to Dale and he was always thinking he could get out, but wasn't sure yet negotiations. And so, but I thought again, you know, to me, if I, no, it wasn't a choice of one or the other, it, but in my mind, I went, if the opportunity came to do the 18, that much that was more of a the next step for me the 28 had a a lot of you know okay that's a little bit different you know and a lot I'm of pressure two years into it and dale jarrett's you know six years into it or eight years you know he's obviously a veteran of the sport at that point in time so my natural gut instinct tells me it's like okay that, that would make sense right so uh but yeah i didn't Luckily, it didn't come down to it, you know, in a way. But, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, looking back now, I, you know, I would tell myself not to be nervous about it. But at the same time, I was obviously a little bit concerned that 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 car might be a little too much for me at that time for the experience that I had. Right. So now, you know, again, I'm whatever, three years old at the time, so I don't know. But looking back on it, those mid 90s into the 2000s, that is that is you know, the peak of money in NASCAR, Joe Gibbs is there, the 18 car is a big deal, you sit down, now you're like a professional athlete signing a big, a big contract, did it, did it feel like a big jump going to, to the Gibbs team? It did, I mean, it was a different, a different feel, uh, you know, uh, they had a lot, I mean, you know, just different atmosphere, shop, uh, personnel in different categories and you know uh the org chart and you know this here and that you know i mean it was it was it was different you know and you know they had already been added a couple years um probably, probably did you did you make years. a whole ton more money uh well as it went on for sure you know okay but instantly it's like you know uh i got a pay raise instantly and then as time went on, you know, you just renegotiated your contracts as the, as the climate negotiated, as they negotiated with their sponsors, right? Right. So it just kind of went in unison with that. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, and I, I don't know that, I don't know, I'll be honest with you, I never negotiated a contract with them. I just said that they offered me X amount, I always took it. I didn't okay. negotiate. And the only thing I asked for, I said, just, just pay me the same every month. I don't care about percentages or anything like that. I mean, I'd care about percentages. If you win, you win. It's more, but just pay me the same every month. You know, just just give me, you know, for words, just give me a thousand dollars a month instead yep. of two thousand one month and zero the next month. Just so, so you could I, budget. I, I figured I was like, if I was flatlined, that way I knew how to pay my taxes every quarter, and I didn't have to worry about this. And at the end of the year, if I got a good bonus, that's great. And if I didn't, no big deal. So I never really negotiated, I don't think I ever negotiated dollars, dollar figure. They just, you know, cost of living increase, you know, they went up and they went up and, you know, they do it every two years or every three years and sponsors every three years or five years. And, 
So we just did it that way. Right. Now, you know, you get in the 18 car. Do you, obviously, your, is your goal at the time, you've got this burning desire to win, I assume. And is your goal at the time like, hey, you know, maybe a year or two years into this, we can win a championship kind of thing? I didn't know where it would go. I mean, I have no idea. I mean, they'd won a couple races. They won at Charlotte um, in 94 and then the Daytona 500 before that. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, all I knew is is when we went to test at Texas Motor Speedway in the fall or December of 1994. So we go down there to test, and, you know, it's a whole new race car. It's a, um, uh, it's a Hopkins chassis. You know, it's different people. We've got X amount of this, this degree spindle. We've got, you know, truck arms of this. And, you know, the body looks great. It's a Chevrolet, you know. And we got a Hendrick motor, right? So I remember leaving pit road and I've never been to, well, I've been to Texas motor speedway, but only ran through three and four, then ran a road course. So, so I went out there and left pit road. This is the first time I ever drove this car for these guys. Right. I left pit road, turn one, went through the gears and turn four. I'm wide open and it's banked so much. You about almost wide open. Right. Mm -hmm. So ah, I run about three laps, you know, I come in, they're like, Wow, it's pretty quick. You know, we'd had a whole lot of people to compare to. Chevrolet had an SB2 motor program there with Marcus driving it, Terry driving it. And it's like, okay, how did it feel? Felt great. My gosh, I looked at the speedometer. It was 201 going into one. I'm like, dude, I want to go faster, right? So, I mean, it just, you know, I mean, I thought right then, I thought, hopefully we'll be fast, right? I mean, you know, it, all that stuff adds up to your stomach telling you, I've got a gut instinct that we're going to be good. And, you know, we go to Daytona, we go to the next race, we go to the next race, and, you know, it's a battle. It's a fight, just like every weekend is. But, you know, we qualified good at Daytona. We ran good at Daytona. Uh, I think Rockingham or Atlanta's the next weekend. And we, you know, run good again. You know, run good again. Finish second to Jeff Gordon. It's like, dude, I never finished the top five before, you know. So I'm just as happy as a freaking leprechaun. You know, I'm like, my gosh. So – that really came about pretty early in it, knowing that that test, the times we did go test, and the races that we run were now just – it's easier. You know, it's just – they go faster, right? And so, you know, I mean, I just – I thought for sure we, we had a chance to win because we were fast everywhere we went for the most part, you know. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know – I had to win the first one before I ever thought about the second one, though. And you don't sure. know what – how is that going to happen? When is it going to happen? Right. Now, you have told me before that, that uh, you actually uh, had me laughing pretty good about, uh, I don't know if it was right at that time, but, but getting on a bicycle and doing a bunch of training and, what, sneaking out of the garage so no one saw you going to cycle on the, on the race weekends? Was it right around that time? It was a little bit after that, but not too far, not too much okay. after that. Yeah, and so, yeah, my uh, ex-brother-in-laws, uh, Rodney and Rusty, and one rides today, I mean, very, all the time. And so they got me hooked on it and I would go out and ride and I'm like, dude, I like this, you know, I like, I like this a lot. This is really mm. good. And so, you know, I was, you know, I saw a picture of the day. I think I had like seven bikes at one time, like, you know, <laughs> probably not, not the smart thing to do, but anyway, it looks like the cool thing to have every type of bike, right. Every, every brand. So, so yeah. yeah. And so I would leave after, um, you know, practice was over, it wasn't 95. It was a little bit later, but you know, okay. still driving for the interstate car, interstate car. And, you know, I'd look out the window and see if in the motor home to see if I'd see anybody and like, okay, I think everybody's kind of made their way out and, you know, inside I'd put on my spandex and my Jersey and I'd get on my bike and spool up and I'd head out the tunnel and go for a ride, you know, cause I didn't want nobody to see me, you know, cause I, in my mind, I'm like, Hey, don't make fun of me. Right. right? B, I don't want you to know what I'm doing because after 35 miles, a couple hours later from Michigan on the side roads, I come back. I mean, you know, you're tired, you feel good, and hopefully you're stronger, better, you know, whatever it might be, whatever you think you're doing to yourself as far as the goodness of it. Uh, you know, I want that. I want, I want every advantage I can take or I can get. So I thought at that point in time, cycling was pretty, you know, was the right thing to do. Right, because, you know, much before that... <clears throat> Like, I, I, 
I look at it, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe there was a few guys earlier, but kind of those early 90s, Schumacher comes into to racing, and he's, you know, the fittest guy, period. And that kind of changed things for every race car driver. Now, you, you, you know, if one guy levels up, everyone else has to level up. Yeah. Um, you know, were you, do you think you were one of the earlier guys working out and really looking <laughs> after yourself? Well, Mark Martin was the first, I, I think, you know, okay. I, I would say that he had to be the first or one of the first. And, and he, as his story is, I mean, he fell out of the seat, you know, at, at, at Nashville and he was not, you know, strong enough. And so he had to work at it. Right. And, um, so I'd say he was first and then, you know, he's more strength training, obviously, um, than cardiovascular. And then, you know, I mean, I think if you take a look at all the Goodyear posters from every year, when they take a picture of everybody at Daytona, you'll see how their regimen is over the winter time, right? Right. And so how big's the uniform? How big is how big's your butt? How big's your chest, right? How big how many chins you got? So as every year goes on, I mean, and Mark was probably the the pioneer of just, you know, being being that guy and uh I'll add my hero. And he's my hero. Sure. And uh, you know, so and I mean I, I mean I had a moment it's like my mom had a, a heart attack, and so I go to the hospital, and they say, well, she just had a little blockage. We're going to put a stent in. She'll be home tomorrow, you know, and I'm like, but it kind of made me think about running on the treadmill. I had a treadmill, but I looked at it. I didn't do anything on it. I just, well, you know, if I got on it, it'd be better, but I know I don't want to get on it because it's too much work, right? So when that happened with her, I went, got on the treadmill because I'm like, I don't want to do that because I was in the Bahamas on the in the off season and I felt like I gained so much weight I couldn't tie my shoes. You know what I mean? So you have those moments that go like, hmm, I think I need to do something here, right? So that was my kind of moment and Mark had a something and everybody's got a little something probably or they make that decision. But uh, it's amazing how you look at those Goodyear posters from back in the day and I don't want to name too many people, but you know, the the sizes of people today compared to then is totally different, right? I mean, everybody has, everybody has taken it, you know, into play as far as, uh, getting in shape. Yeah. Yeah. And I think again, going back to the difference between back then and today is, is you could just go test your way into, into race shape and, yeah. you know, run a, run a million miles in the car and you're strong enough doing that. Now yeah. you got to show up and be able just to, to do it and not suffer too much. Yeah, Tyler Reddick to me, I think is one of the few, one of the most. I can see you can see a change in his whole body, you know, in composition and, and mental. You know, you can talk to him, and I mean, you just look at what a picture might have been two or three years ago. He, nothing. I mean, he went right. out of shape, of course, but he just he really has taken like a and his, you know, just you can see that that happening with him. And I pick him, great, good guy, and I think a lot of him, and just the way he's changed that his body composition, whatever he does, I don't even know. But, uh, you know, back in the day, I didn't want nobody to know that I was doing it. And I felt like I had to, because if I didn't, I'd be, I'd have blown up like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Yeah. Yeah. So preparing for this yesterday, I watched the after the race celebration <laughs> where you had won Atlanta and your brother had secured the championship and myself, you know, my, my brother's my best friend. So like it, it brought a tear to my eye, honestly, how cool was that? Yeah, I mean, that was obviously, you know, leading up to that race. I mean, we knew that Terry had the chance for the championship, and I was going for my first win of the year. We, um, um, I think we had Hendrick Motors, and we kind of did our own motors. And so Mark Cronquist is there, and we're, you know, we haven't won yet. And, you know, we're, we're you know, getting better every weekend. And so we go to Atlanta. I think I qualified first, and uh, he was fourth, fifth, something like that. He might have been – yeah, he's fourth, I think, third or fourth. Then – uh so, I mean, obviously, both of us running good on the weekends is totally fun as brothers go and parents proud of their sons, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and it was funny because Saturday night we're in the motorhome, either mine or his, and we were talking and just chit-chatting. And uh, it's like, man, it'd be cool if you won the race, I won the championship. I'm like, yeah, it would be. You know, it's like, ah, oh, yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> all right, we'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, or, or whatever, you know. And uh, we just laugh it off. And, um, uh, so his PR guy came up to me before the race said, Hey, can I put this hat in your car? It's just, it's a number five hat. I said, negative, no way, captain, not going to happen right here. 
like, nope, don't even think about it, right? So I'm like, can't do that. So anyway, Terry Why, because you were superstitious? Are we all? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You know, you don't yeah. do that. That's the ultimate. Don't do that. <laughs> I know, I so, know. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, so I – um so he told me, he said, man, I'd like to lead a lap if I could because I always paid five points at the time, you know. So Gordon had loose wheels and took off and I let, moved over, let Terry lead a few laps and I took off. And then I just ran my race, you know. So he got five points for leading. I'm not sure if Jeff got five or not later, if he come back or not to lead, lead any. But anyway, mm-hmm. long story short, we got to the end of it. And um, I think the best moment for us is obviously, you know, as it, as it turned out, how does this happen? Where I win the race, he wins the championship. How does that happen? You can't write the book. You can't script it. You can't even make it up. I mean, it's too hard. Mm -hmm. So it happens, and we get to victory lane, and there's double victory lane kind of-ish where there's pictures of, obviously, our parents sitting there, standing there. And, I mean, you think about us, and you think about Kurt and Kyle Busch are the only two that could, you know, kind of do this right now, I guess, right? You know, we're both sons win the same day, not first and second, but first and first. So we got a picture of Gibbs, myself, Rick Hendrick, Terry, parents, and all that stuff. And so the biggest joke that we had afterwards, we got done with all the celebration. And, you know, that whole, I mean, t- me, you know, going beside Terry for a half a lap, you know, I was, you know, that obviously, you know, it just happened. And, you know, no burnouts. You just go to Victory Lane and do your normal stuff like you're supposed to. And I get there. We go back to the motorhome that night. and We're standing, we're sitting in there and. My dad's in there watching TV, and he goes, pretty good day. I said, yeah. He said, the Cowboys won, too. I said, well, Dallas Cowboys winning. See there? You got two guys from Texas winning. You got the parents of these two guys, and you got the Cowboys winning. What can you say, right? It's a great yep. day. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, probably will never be repeated again. Yeah, I, that would be hard. I mean, that, again, that's just hard for the, you think about the whole, that whole situation. Right. <clears throat> Did anything happen between then and you winning the championship in 2000 as far as, you know, improvements with the team or improvements for you mentally or things just clicking or, you know, understanding more what it takes to win one of these championships? Uh, yeah, all the above. I mean, it just was, it's, everything was, you know, is was clicking. I mean, obviously from 96, but, you know, 97, we just kept improving on, you know, racetracks that I struggled at, you know, I mean, Pocono was like awful, you know, and then we would, we would go and, you know, we would test more and try this and try that. And the driver would always say it's tight in the center or loose off or loose in. And, you know, you always work on trying to fix things. And, you know, we had Derek was there and we'd have a roll balance sheet and I'd learn a little bit more about it. And then I'd want to not know more about it and just drive the car. And, you know, then we get Tony Stewart, we get a teammate, right? We get Tony Stewart and, he blows in there without a preconceived notion of what a cup car is. And that, that was like the best thing that could have ever happened for us as an organization, because at that time he didn't, he didn't know what an 1800 pound spring was. He didn't care. Right. Where I had, I cared because I knew about them. I touched them. I felt them. I cut them. I put them in, I've taken them out and I've thrown them away, you know? So he had that, you know, that notion. He didn't care if it was what it was. Right. So he and Zippy just, they were like, take it off like holy crud you know how do you do that right so we would always you know i mean and and so when he came i mean that kind of it pushed both of us to get better or pushed us both to get better and so i mean that was one thing i mean if we hadn't had that i mean would i I want a championship absolutely not you know if it wasn't for tony stewart and greg and them having another team you know that wouldn't have happened obviously our team was getting better and better and better we were trying things differently just like we could back then um, you know, you didn't buy anything. You had to build it. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you know, you just kind of went and went and went. And we, I remember going to Pocono in 90, I think it was 98. And I finished like fifth. So now let, let me, let me back up. We didn't run that good the first race. And we, Derek and I were watching TV of the tape of the race. And I said, damn that Jeremy Mayfield, his car's dragging down the straightaway. How, what's wrong? They must Something must be falling off their car. The tailpipes are falling off. The bolts come out of it. What the heck's going on? So him and probably Peter Suspenza and whoever was crew chief at the time, well, they figured out how to get the car lower, right? Right. So, I mean, throughout all this, you think about going the wind tunnel with ride height, and you blow it, and it's like, okay. Well, Derek had 
actuators and we dropped the car down where because we knew ride height and it's like that just opened up a whole pandora's box right oh wow look at all that what it does here you know so anyway we're doing all that and so i watched jeremy at 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 pocono i think he won that race i'm like what in the world so we we go back to pocono and i finished fifth and I, i'm the same dumb driver from the race before like i you know i don't i'm not sure if i know these three corners or if i'm just running a different track yeah and we finished fifth and i was like where where do you go to the gas pumps at because i've never been to the gas pumps there because you got to go to the gas pumps after the race so we kept getting better we kept getting better and trying things and trying things and then 99 we just we kept having a better year you know better races and we didn't load at every track a little bit faster and make the changes a little smarter and Tony's over there and we're sharing information and, you know, we get to 2000 and, you know, we're, you know, was, we had a better average finish, but we weren't as fast, but we were better, you know, and then Tony wins the championship in 2002, I think, you know, so Mm -hmm. it's just, you know, a lot of it, you know, and I think mentally you just, when you have more confidence, you just, you have more confidence, you have more confidence, you're going to get faster. And so Bobby Hamilton asked me one time, he said, how do you do that? What's that? I said, how do you, how do you get in the car at Pocono and just run wide open into turn one like that when we changed to a body style? I said, so all these guys here is just, you, you don't have a question. There's not a question mark. So. Right. Right. So you go, you go back to back championships in the sense that you win the IROC championship in, in Oh one. Now I remember the, the IROC series, you know, and not really understanding it. How how did that all come about? It was you guys and IndyCar drivers. Is that what it was? It was a little bit of both. I mean, yeah, I mean, both for sure. And then there was some times there was a Bush driver, Randy LaJoy, and then Steve Kinzer drove. Um, I'd have to look back at the picture. Obviously, Kenny Brack was in there. Uh, Al Jr. was in there. He might have been already out by the time I got in there. But So but mainly IndyCar and NASCAR, mainly. Mm-hmm. So. And how many races did they run for the for that season? And was it like a was it a bunch of money to win or something like that? Like what made it worth your while, kind of thing? Yeah, it was obviously by invitation. Uh, four four races, and it was at four tracks you're already at, right? Right. So obviously I'm already there, and uh, I think you know the races didn't pay nothing, but the championship paid two hundred thousand if you won the championship, and then it was down from there to whatever it went to, and then it was zero after that probably. So when they ran four races and there's Daytona, Talladega, Michigan, Indy, Daytona, Talladega, Talladega, Indy. Um, then they, after I got out of it, they would run Richmond, Chicago, and Darlington, a few other other tracks. But uh, they ran Fontana uh, a couple times as well. The first time I ever got in it was when Robbie Gordon got hurt and uh, Les Richter come over and said, hey, could you drive this? And I said, well, I got an appearance with Coach down the street here. I can't practice. And. I tell I asked Jim, I said, please let me run this car. I, I, he's like, I want you to run it too. So we we kind of threw through the through the coach out out the window as far as asking him and I ended up I run second in the race and then, you know, so then when I was better in the cup series they invited me, you know, to do it. So they only invited X amount of people, twenty twelve cars. So that was a concept. Right. That was a concept. Twelve drivers, equally prepared cars, uh, you know, Martin Martin's gonna win probably and then whoever finishes second on back was <laughs> probably the rest of them right right to jump ahead and i don't know if i uh if i've ever heard you talk about leaving leaving gibbs how did that all go down yeah i mean that was you know i mean of course i could always sit back and go well i wish that would have happened or wish we hadn't done that Mm -hmm. uh you know the transition you know jimmy the the team growing um growing as a team two cars gonna go to three you know, we need more people, general manager. Obviously, Jimmy knows everything about nuts and bolts to money to A to Z and Gibbs. So I got a different crew chief. And then, you know, just, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, you you don't run good for a year. You have, you know, you're not as good as you want to be and you get frustrated. And then, you you know, you change crew chief. You get a little bit better and then you – but you're still not, you know, where you once were because you got a championship that you're – your bar where you, okay, this is where we're supposed to be. Right. You know, and how do we get back there? And then, you know, somebody says, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll give you everything that they have and better, you know, we'll make it better. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know. It just, you know, kind of a time thing and just, you know, a little bit of a, you know, well, I mean, but, and at the same time, 
I mean, heck, I'm not winning races, you know, like, you know, who wants me? And at that point in time, it, it's like, you know, makes sense to go try to find greener pastures, I guess, you know, I don't remember. I mean, I don't remember how, I mean, it's just like, well, frustration and I say frustration, just, you know, I feel like maybe I've run my course. Right. And, right. you know, and at that point in time, you're like, you know, I'm riding my bike more, but I'm not getting any better, you know? So it's like, what is it? Right. So then it's like, well, you know, you, maybe it's, yeah, you know, and you see it, everybody drives besides a couple guys, Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson, but the, everybody drives for one team and they go somewhere else and they find success. And that's, you know, cause they got stagnant here and something got stagnant around them. And, you know, I mean, for me, I went from a one car team and they're growing and, went from one crew chief and, you know, now another and another and, you know, the sports changing, you know, everything's changing. And, you know, uh, I'm probably still the same. I have still some of the same uh, characteristics of the graduating class from Hagen racing that I kind of still want to, I feel like I need to know more about this and probably should have let it go. It's hard to do though. You know what I mean? So all that encompasses a lot of it, you know, between your ears, but a lot of it's that way. And Tony Stewart, he, he came in with, he didn't know 1800 pounds spring, like I said, so it was easier for him to transition into anything. Cause it, it didn't matter, you know, where me, I had to, you know, if they said, Hey, we're going to put a 3000 pound right rear spring out. I'd say, I know what that is. And that's not going to be good. You know, <laughs> I'm not going right. to drive that, you know? So you just, you have those things and that come with you just by your, you know, by how you grew up, I think. Right. So do you, would you say that you, you struggled to adapt to just how the cars really changed over those, those kind of late two thousands, you know, bigger bar and, and getting lower and whatnot? Well, I, I, well, we succeeded in that early and then mm-hmm. they went to the next level on the next level and it was harder to probably keep up with, you know, and just, you know, I mean, and then, you know, if you don't keep up one week and then you get behind the second week and then the third week you're, you know, you're like, what am I doing? Right. I mean, and you can't extract it all from your brain to, you know, I don't care if we're bump stopping. I just can't feel it right. You know, I mean, I can't, if we're coal binding and, you know, Stuart says, you're not going to like it for about half a day and then you're going to love it. And you're right. It is, it is, you know, but you just, you got to get that feel and go fast. You know, if you don't have the feel and go fast, you know, what are you doing? Right. Right. Did you, you know, run because you ran. You ran essentially full time until 2016. Am I right, or, or kind of uh, lesser races near the end? I'd have to check the record book on that one, but I I ran whatever. I ran like four races a year for a couple of years, so okay. I can't remember if it was 16 and then a couple of races here and there, or 14 and a couple of races till 16. Right. Right. So in those in those later years, you know, frankly, you're in in lesser equipment. You know, being a, I'm sure, a competitive guy who hates to lose, like we all are, uh, how did, how did, what was the mentality going into those weekends? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, you know, obviously went to the petties and, you know, hopped around a little bit, um, you know, got kind of a, you know, thought we had a long term thing there going and, you know, could always see progress. I mean, sure. If you see progress, you know, you're, you're, you're willing to, you're willing to wait, or yep. at least I am. So, you know, and then that deal kind of got all jumbled up in a bad way, you know, so then you got to go find something else, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, something happens, right. And, you know, I look back on that and, you know, I had nothing in December and then all of a sudden I had something in December, right. And that was a great opportunity to, to keep going for a little bit. And, but, you know, also I look back and I'm like, oh, if that hadn't never, if that had never happened, would that have been okay? It might've been. Right. But, you know, you, 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 you have to restart and go to another situation of like, okay, we're going to do this. And I mean, you know, none of us ran, none of us won races. I mean, you know, you're, you're still trying to fight the good fight, you know, and then you, you know, you fight another good fight and you fight the the last good fight. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, the sport was changing so fast and, you know, multi-car teams were just growing they weren't growing, but they were all getting better, you know? So mm-hmm. if, if once you could beat, you could beat three out of four, now you can't beat any out of four, you know? So then you're 25th and I mean, you know, and it, it, you know, again, it goes back to the, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question or not, but it gets back to the, you know, 
I don't mind the engineer telling me how fast we're going to go, but it wasn't as exciting when the engineer said, you're the best we're going to do is 25th. And it doesn't matter if I know how to drive or if I don't know how to drive, we're going to do P25th. I'm like, yeah, well, that's kind of stinks, you know, and that was before the first practice, you know, so right. it's like, I know this, it's the truth, but it's like, ah, oh, you're right. Well, if we finished 18th, it's because everybody wrecked. Yep. Yep. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> I mean, so it got kind of frustrating. And then when you're not with, you know, when you couldn't, you know, I say, I mean, maybe I could have made a difference. So you always look back and go, well, I guess I could have been better at that, but if sure. I could have made a difference, it would have been different, but knowing what they know and knowing how it is, it's. It is what it is. So that was tough. I mean, that was hard. Uh, but, you know, but I mean, you know, I loved racing and I love the people and still trying to help, you know, whether it was, you know, make some difference in some team, if hopefully better than worse. And I'm sure it wasn't great. But, you know, if I could have made anything better, that that's what I tried to do. And uh, yeah. if uh, I guess if I didn't, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I tried to, at least uh, my desire was to always, you know, always do better. Right. So shortly after your kind of last last few cup races, you, you go over and race in the Euro Series, mm-hmm. the NASCAR Euro Series. What what was that like? Because, I mean, in my, you know, having never been in one of those cars or, or been over to see one of those races, from the outside, it looks very European type type racing. All those guys are, are real road course racers, or a lot of those guys are. And, you know, it, it looks like you know, they look like NASCARs, but it's very European racing. Was that kind of how, how you found it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it was a, uh, it was a great opportunity. Um, you know, I, I, you know, uh, Jerome and Ann Galpin, uh, Joe Balish, um, uh, you know, actually Scott Miller is probably the one that he asked me at Daytona, what are you going to do? And da, 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 and you know, this and that. And I was like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, talk to somebody you know and so he he said oh i'll give him a call and i'll have him call you right i mean so he kind of helped really kind of help connect the dots there uh but yeah i mean those cars and the whole european flair i mean we went to europe 10 times in one year so i mean who can complain about that and i definitely will never complain about that so um we had a great time and we met some of the greatest people i mean everywhere we went no matter if they were at the racetrack or at the hotel or at a restaurant or anywhere in between that we could have two or three days we could go somewhere and, um, you know, the cars are, you know, you know, they're, they're stock cars. So yep. they're coal overs, uh, rack and pinion, I think. I know they were, I might change after that, but anyway, or they changed, they were not before, but maybe afterwards, oh, they probably were the whole time. But anyway, pull over, you know, and I mean, it's just like a stock car. It's just the same thing as a stock car. It's just more like my late model stock days, you know, probably more so like that. Just, you know, fiberglass bodies. You know, engineering is, you know, like, you know, yeah. kind of went away from the, hey, you're going to be 25th, you know, no matter what. But all those things into play, I mean, equal, you know, a lot of equal because uh, everybody had the same chassis. Everybody had, you know, you had to run some of the same, a lot of the same things, right? So kind of made a, a spec series per se. But, you know, probably the biggest thing, the challenge I had was only 400 horsepower. And it was like, man, I feel like I'm putting my foot in mud, you know, because I'm not used to that. But, mm-hmm. uh but yeah, and then and then you go to tracks uh, that are you know, uh, you know historic in Europe, right? I mean they all are, but some more than others. And you know, first time I went to Brands Hatch, I'm like, man, this is awesome, right? I mean, I remember IndyCar is racing here, and I talked to Johnny Rutherford later in the year or two later, and I told him where we went to. He said I finished fourth there. I said, yeah, I saw his picture on the wall, you know. And so, I mean, just what a cool place that's been around for so long and so historic and uh, you know, went to Hockenheim, we went to Zolder, we went to, um, um, uh, in Spain, I can't think of the name of it right now. Anyway, uh, went down Valencia to Spain. or something. Or Valencia, Zand- yeah, Valencia, Zandvoort, Spain. Zandvoort too, I think. Yep, went to Valencia, yeah. yep. And, yeah. uh, so we did all kinds of stuff. I mean, you'd be able to go to these tracks and, you know, the competition, you're right, to your point, it's like, that, you know, when we went to the one oval track that we ran, which was basically in a parking lot at some... right. European Walmart, you know, that we had to go through the handicap parking to get out to the track and make laps, right? Uh, I was I was not in my element at any of those road courses, right? I mean, it was like, whew, holy, I mean, because these guys, they probably race road courses every week, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, my teammate, uh, Fred Gabion, 
and 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 everybody there. I mean, they were great uh, to work with. It just was, you know, difficult for me because I'm not a road racer, and I, I, you have to be. You better be really, 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 really good to go do that against the guys that are doing that, you know, 12 races a year, and that's their backyard, you know. So uh, the old track that we did do, at least I felt like I was, at least I felt like I was on a normal, I was normal there, you know, instead right. of like, what am I doing at freaking Zolder? I don't even know which way to go, you know. <laughs> yeah. But very European feel, too. I mean, it's American, yeah. but yet European, so. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm I'm actually I'm buddies with uh, Alon Day, so we always have yeah. uh, we we chat every once in a while, and he's always saying, "Hey, I'll run the the NASCAR Pinty's car at Mostport, and you run the Euro Series car at Brands Hatch. We should do that trade. So one day yeah. I'll do that trade with him." Absolutely, great guy, very tough competitor, great guy. Got to talk to him several times, and uh, yeah, fast. You know, I mean, just he knows. I mean, it's like I don't know how he does it. You know, he just uh, he's just really good. I mean, you, yeah. you know that, so. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, lately you've been running the SRX series, and that is like, you know, in my mind, similar to the IROC series <clears throat> and just unbelievable what they've been able to do as far as viewership, as far as how good the show is, as far as having, you know, legends like yourself and everyone else in, in the field. Uh Tell me, tell me about that experience, kind of how that, you know, starting that and, and how you felt going into that series when it was brand new. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, obviously Ray, Ray was a big, Ray was the, the one behind that. I remember seeing him, right. we went to an auction one time a couple of years before that. And I was looking for some stuff for a friend of mine and we went there and I saw Ray and he's like, Hey, I've got this idea you know, trying to figure out how to make it work, kind of like the IROC series, but, you know, I don't know. We just, we keep thinking on it. I said, all right, are you in? Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. So as the time went on, obviously Ray doing his thing, and they start putting it all together with uh, CBS and, um, you know, you know, Ilmore, Fury Chassis, whatever, however it's all getting combined, and Tony and George and Sandy and <clears throat> all that, putting it all together, you know, that uh, – uh, I think it was Willie T texted me and said, Hey, I think they're going to do it or whatever. And so I texted Ray. He's like, yeah, I'll send you a contract right now. So anyway, so the first year, obviously, um, you know, don't know how all it's going to go, you know, but you know, it's going to be a big deal, big splash. And you just hope that it, you know, makes a presence and, you know, stays consistent. So yeah, that was uh, awesome. I mean, I was so thankful that Ray and Tony and all them, George, they thought enough of me to, to ask me to go race in the series and, uh, yeah, I mean, what a great time when you can race against, you know, um, so many different disciplines in the sport with these drivers. And, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, Paul Tracy earlier, Alio, I raced with him in IROC and Kanan known him for years as far as, you know, things, I guess. And then you got, you, you know, obviously Tony, uh, you know, Stewart, and then, uh, you know, Bill Elliott, you got Willie T ribs and, you know, Michael Walter and, you know, you have all these, you know, superstars of the sport and SRX and yeah. So year one was great. And year two, Don Hawk was in there this year and, you know, uh, picked up, you know, picked up where it left off. And I thought we had another good, you know, season as far as, uh, you know, races and the show and Marco winning championship. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and the races were, I mean, the races are great. I tell people all the time, they're like, you know, you know, what's it like to drive one of those? I'm like, well, I can only tell you my heart rate because I wear a chest strap is as high as it is on that Saturday night as it would be on any other Saturday night racing, you know, racing in a race car yeah. and a race car. It's the same thing. We might all look like we're, what are we doing? Or are y'all having fun? I'm like, yeah, we're having fun, but it, it don't matter how, if it's another Saturday night, a race car, I'm still having fun, a high, a high heart rate. Right. So the competition is, is incredible. And I, I, again, people ask me all the time and I'm like, you know, Joseph Newgarden unloads at, at, um, uh, uh, Nashville, it's, you know, hometown, but not this type of guy. He's fast, you know, I was like, Holy cow. You know, uh, you know, you go to, you know, slinger and, uh, uh, Finn house. He's so fast, you know, yeah. uh, you go to run a dirt track and you got, uh, Cody Swanson, you know, I mean, so racing against so many of these different guys and Bloomquist and, you know, different disciplines and, uh, you know, Willie T was a blast last year. And then, uh, you know, this year, you know, we had chase obviously wins, you know, 
of course he wins and then Ryan and Dave yeah. and some other guys. I mean, it's just, it, it really is, um, it's fun. My wife and I, we take our motor home and we just go from track to track and, you know, we enjoy it and love being a part of it. And, um, you know, I had a little bit more of a job description last year. I was in charge of the, the crappers at the motor home at the track for the motor home lot. But this year I didn't quite have that. <laughs> so I don't know why, but I had the yellow shirt on and I had all the phone numbers to all the Porta John people and get everybody helped out. So we just had a good time. I mean, it really was and Biffle and yeah. I mean, so you just think about all these guys and, uh, you know, like I said, probably, you know, the three most competitive guys out there are Marco, Elio and, and, uh, Tony can So okay. it's just crazy how, you know, they just show up and, you know, Elio won at, at new Sparta and like, dude, you're not a, I mean, I know he's won IROC, but it's like, you're, you're going to IndyCar racing next weekend. You know I mean? You know, it's just, yeah. but they, they're just so good. You know, they're just so good at anything they do. Yeah. Do you, cause you're, you're, and, uh, forgive me if, if, uh, talking about your age isn't, isn't appropriate, but, uh, you're almost 60 in a few years. Do you have any plans to, to retire <laughs> from racing or are you going full, full Paul Newman until you, you're done? I don't know if you can see me or not, but that's yeah, okay. Right. Okay. We'll, we'll edit this part out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I give it that, well, we'll do it one more time or we'll do mm-hmm. it, one, you know, and I mean, I'm not, trust me. Uh, I, I want, I see things, uh, will you snowboard? I ski. I, I, ski. I do both. I do both. But yeah. Yeah. Well, there are things, other things that I really want to do too. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I know I can't keep up with you skiing because I see some of your stuff on Instagram, but <laughs> at the same time, I don't, I, I, as I have explained, I'm not going to do this forever. Mm-hmm. So there's my, the, you know, there's the caveat is that's, it's not going to be forever, but you know, right now, knock on wood, if I can stay healthy and wealthy and wise or whatever you want to call it. And I can, you know, still do what I want to do and enjoy it and not, you know, I don't want to look like a fish out of water either. So just, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, I'll just put it this way. It's, it's, it's closer than it ever was Sure. To where I don't, I won't be doing something, you know, but like when we did the, uh, you know, if, if, uh, um, uh, if we ran the pro-am again, if they came back to the SVR, I mean, you know, those things like that, you know, that, that would be, those are the fun, those are fun things, you know, the, yeah. the SRX is really serious. It's not, it's fun, but it's serious. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's a little bit different, but yet at the same time, uh, you know, I, I, I know that I, I, the fun parts, it's good for a long time. The serious part, you know, like, Hey, it's, it wears you out a little bit. Sure. Sure. What, uh, you mentioned doing other stuff. Is it you, your, your wife is a, a currently, or was a professional cyclist? Is that correct? Yes, she was a pro. Was a pro. She's been retired for uh, nearly ten years now. Okay. So, uh, you know, they, so they can't do they can't do what we do as far as longer yeah. in life. You know. Yeah. yeah. No kidding. What's the plan to go? You know, bicycle tours of Europe or something like that. Go, uh, go skiing. Well, no, but we've well, no, but we we have already done that. We went to okay. Girona and did that a few years ago with some friends. Um, we've been different places and done that. Um, you know, we're kind of busy with our business and racing and all that to do that like we want to. Um, I mean, we'd love to do more and, uh, you know, finding the right time and, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, she, when she was racing and raced in Europe and raced here in the States, I mean, she'd train for 500 miles a week and race on the weekends too. So, uh, or not every weekend, but, you know, um, uh, obviously she's got a lot more, miles on a bike than I ever thought I would or think I'll have. And, yeah. uh, when we do our riding around here, again, we, we just didn't get to do much last year. Um, we had our own charity bike ride last year, but we didn't do it this year, but you know, we get out there in a group ride of a hundred people and you know, she's girl on the front. I mean, she's, she's ridden with all the pros, you know I mean? So it's, it's no big deal. So, um, like the other day I saw, uh, yeah, you, know, you ever heard Robbie Ventura? Uh, why do I know the name? Professional hmm. cyclist, you know, I'm okay. not sure okay. of his whole story. But anyway, I was in Winston-Salem for a whole different thing, and I forgot the bike race was there and saw Chad, and I was like, uh, God, I didn't even know you guys were here this weekend. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but he texted me that night and said, Hey, we're going to do a sprint race. You want to come and join in like, you know, against, you know, you know, there's Bob roll or, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I do not want to embarrass myself. I haven't yeah. ridden in a while. So, but anyway, yeah, cycling is good. My wife is great. Um, she's, you think about for us mentality wise, she, she has put on a helmet like I have for many years and, you know, mm-hmm. so when she puts on a helmet, it's like me, it's kind of like, Hey, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to win. Uh, that's, you know, that's just the way it goes. Yep. Now I got to ask you while I have you a few current questions, what are your thoughts on Kyle going to the eight car? Uh, good for him. You know, mm-hmm. I made a comment on TV the other day. I said, I believe 1000% sure he will be better than I did leaving the 18 car going to another car. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think you think about it is, you know, the way that the situation is today is this car will not change next year. I mean, unless there's safety, something will change, but aero mechanical i mean there's not going to be much changes in it it'd be pretty much the same thing i would have supposed i mean i don't think they're going to change it and so for him to just land in another car and know that they have fast race cars with tyler you know i mean obviously tyler has proved they can win races and run good everywhere they go uh and he has just basically taken over the seat and the crew and the crew chief are saying so uh talking to andy petrie the other day it's like they're excited you know, I think that he, you know, it's not going to be a, well, I got to help build this team up. You right. Know? I mean, he'll, there will always be things, no matter if you're at the 18 car or the eight car or wherever, that you always have to put everybody in the same, you know, in the same bucket to go the same way. But I think that he'll, I mean, I, I just see, I, I believe he'll have more success next year than he's had so far this year by winning just one race. Sure. Sure. One of the things that got me most excited uh, for, I guess, you know, kind of the whole, the new car and everything going on this year was seeing Kimmy at Watkins Glen racing that, what is it, Project 91? Is that, that what they call mm-hmm. it? Yep. Um, you know, like, to me, that is, that is, as a guy who grew up racing road courses and, and watching a lot of road course racing, to me, that's the most exciting thing going forward is to see who's going to be in that car and hopefully they can race every single road course race. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if it'll just be road course races or will they go oval racing? Will you know, Alio get a shot at it at Daytona, you know I mean? What mm. a great story. Right. And, yep. uh, I'm actually pulling for that one. I'm not sure if I have to deliver money on it, but I'm, I'm <laughs> pulling for it. But yeah, I mean, so, um, I think that that's, uh, you know, Justin Marks and everybody there. I mean, that's really cool. And to see Kimmy come over here, I know he ran the truck race and Xfinity race for Kyle years ago, but yet, you know, what's the, you know, I hear that they've had a lot of calls and people are very interested in it and, you know, Alan Day, you know, Alonzo, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, is that his, is that an opportunity for him that's in a legit, you know, a legit car today over what it was five years ago, four years ago. So, right. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think that that's a, you know, that's, that's going to help our sport. And, you know, I say our sport, NASCAR, I think that's just going to help us and, and, and bring eyeballs to the TV set or in the stands. And that's what we want. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, before I let you go, I ask everyone, everyone who's, who's done it for real, what advice do you have for young kids who want to be a professional race car driver? Yeah, I mean, and I, I've been asked this before, and I so my I'll give you a couple of things. Is that the way I grew up? You know, my brother said, "Win at a track before you advance to the next track." You know, I still think that holds true, even though all the dynamics around it, me having to work on the car, me having to have no money to work on the car, and me to fix the car, is different than today, where that might not be the case because not everybody fixes their own car. People have more money. And, uh, but I still think the advice that Terry gave me is, you know, for anybody young, it doesn't matter if you're go-kart racing or mini stock racing or at Beach Ridge or Stockton or wherever in California or dirt track in Arizona or Texas or, you know, midgets in the Midwest, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, make sure you're really good at it and then go to the next thing, you know, and I mean, that doesn't mean that you can't do a little bit of everything or some other things, but you know, you're not going to be a Jonathan Davenport racing, winning the world 100 at Eldora by the first time ever going there and not knowing what you're doing. Right. I mean, he's, it's always a 20 year story to get to that. Everybody should 
it has that if they're successful. So right. whether you're running Crown Vix at some little short track and but you're winning, next thing, next thing, graduate, graduate, and make those steps accordingly, and try not to worry about your age as much as your your desire and your passion for it. Right. No, I think that's a great answer. Well, I I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. This was this was great. Hopefully I knew we, we had can. To, uh, go yeah, ahead. I, I knew we had to play some to get the time right, but I appreciate you working with me on that and getting it all worked out. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me. I'm glad I saw your message. I usually don't look at that part. Message yep. so much. <laughs> yeah. No. Exactly. Exactly. Anything? Uh, anything you want to tell the people where they can find you, where they should look for you next year, what you're up to? Um. Well, we, you know, hopefully we'll still race some modifieds. Uh, it's like the Northeastern modified just in the South. And maybe we'll do some Northern races. We did Stafford this year. We'd like to do some more. And then if we, uh, if as long as I didn't do anything wrong in the SRX and they want to invite me back, I'll probably do that. And uh, my wife and I are busy with our companies and we'll be at, uh, we'll be at NASCAR races, IndyCar races and, hope some f1 races being race fans and that's what we've done this year is we love doing that and i was hung out in the parking lot at darlington for the southern 500 after the race was over and was having a great time with the fans there and uh we'll do the same thing at martinsville and you know we'll we'll start the year off next year in florida as well so uh i don't know racing a little bit and just enjoying life a lot and uh so i guess you'll who knows where you'll see me i guess maybe yeah, well, you'll see you... me on a Maybe you'll see me on a ski slope somewhere. Sure. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's and gonna if you're... have to be, and it's gonna have to be in the in the states, not in Canada. You got it. Got it. If yeah. you're ever up at the Toronto Indy, uh, we're I don't know twenty minutes away from there. So reach out to yeah. me. I was yeah. I was there a couple of years ago. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I yep. remember that. Yep. So we'll uh, we'll definitely have to hook up, and would love to catch up with you at, if uh, if you're doing any racing uh, down here with. Uh, uh, Pirella or anything like that. I'm not sure, but if you are, yep. we'll try to catch you there. Oh, sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Gary. All right. Take care. If you guys right. enjoy Bye. the podcast, be sure to rate it wherever you listen to the podcast and share it with some friends. See you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks.